I'm Sergey Panov, and this is Violin Explained. Today's discussion is with an incredibly talented and successful musician, Ashlyn Olson, who is involved in the business of classical music at one of the world's premier artist management companies that support some of the world's most recognized names in music, arts, and entertainment. We will cover topics such as how do artists make it to perform at the world's best concert halls, what opportunities for musicians are out there that are not performance-based but are just as important and meaningful, how you can create your own opportunities gain experience in the business aspects of classical music, what kinds of jobs are out there, where to find them, and their compensation, being a woman in a classical business setting, and how the business of classical music works. And now for my discussion with Ashlyn Olson. Ms. Olson, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Of course, so happy to be here. Good. So I've had the privilege of playing with you as your stamp partner in Candide um, Opera by Mm -hmm. Leonard Bernstein, and I have to say you're a phenomenal violinist. Um, but that is not what you do for a living. Um, Can you share with us what it is your official job title, what it means? Um, Even though you're a musician, you're a player, but that's not what you do for the most part of the day. Could you share with us a little bit about your day job? Yes. So I work for Opus 3 Artists, which is a classical music management company. And my job title is Associate Director of Operations. I do all sorts of little things. Um, I, sometimes I describe my job as a catch-all um, for the company, um, just to make the company um, run as best as it possibly can. So I, I do little things like um, I train our, our new staff. I help get us set up for conferences. Um, I work with all of the the tech that we that we use, all the different programs that we need to have, um, email and phone stuff like that, just to make sure that we can function. How did you end up doing what you do and what path did you take to get there? So it was kind of a long path for me. Um, I started playing violin when I was three and a half. Um, Might come from a family of musicians. So my mom just brought a violin home for me one day um, and said, look, here's what I have for you. This is what we want you to try. Um, So I played violin my whole life. I can't remember a time when I didn't play it. And I always knew that I wanted to go into music. Um, I studied performance for my undergrad, my master's, and then I did a performer's certificate. So I never took any um, business classes, any music management. Um, I had no idea that the industry even existed, honestly. Uh, When I finished school, I was really burnt out. I was having anxiety because I didn't know what I wanted to do next. I had just gone straight from schooling to schooling, and I just, I needed something different. Um, when I was in my undergrad, I had been given a work study job to work stage crew. So I, I would set up for rehearsals, for performances, work backstage at performances. Something I really liked to do is a little bit um, like organizing chaos, which I always really liked to do. Um, and so I, I did that in my undergrad, but then I also kept doing it when I went to DePaul for my master's and then through... Um, when I did my performer certificate. That's how I supported myself in college. So when I when I finished school, I got a job working at Ravinia at the Staines Institute, which is a program for young artists. And then I met a, a colleague there who had just left Opus 3, my current company, and she knew that they were looking for, for people. She really liked working with me. We had a really good relationship, and she recommended me for a position in New York. I was moving to New York already for personal reasons, um, and I just like miraculously found this job on my, my second day in New York. Wow, wonderful. Do you have any regrets from changing to be a performer to uh, a business side of classical music? Sure. It, it was really hard for me at first, um, especially when I was working at the Staines Institute at Ravinia, because that's a program for young artists, people who are around my age, who are doing what I had thought I wanted to do my whole life, and I wasn't able to do that. That was really hard for me. Um, and, and even when I moved to New York and I started working at Opus 3, it took me a really long time to to find the right place for me at Opus 3 and to find a balance in my life where I could still be performing, which I do a lot still, um, but also have another job that I really like doing. But that also gives me some sort of job security and security in life that gives me health insurance, um, a stable paycheck. And it gives me the freedom now to do the performing and the teaching that I want to do. But when I first made that switch, it was really hard for me and I did have regrets. Mm. 
I don't think most aspiring musicians, whether in high school, college, or even adult life, know the business side of classical music. So can you just, in a nutshell, give us why does Opus 3 exist? What purpose do they serve? Um, like, why does someone need music management? Like, like what, you know, like, wh- why does it exist? And, and also why you have a job? Of course. Yeah. So we serve, we exist to guide the careers of our artists. So, and that's, really broad obviously right so we do everything for them like booking them with orchestras with chamber music um series allowing them finding places for them to play recitals it's a lot of work and if it was just on the artists themselves or even if they had somebody helping them it would be you know such a long process we do all of the contracting for their um engagements so it's just that's a really involved process but then we we guide them in other ways too. We want to make sure that they're getting out of their career what they want, that they're performing the repertoire that they want to play and the places they want to play. So we help guide them and, and bring them, build their careers up um, to what what they want. We can also help with marketing um, and PR and finding the right connections for them. So the industry is so big. There's so many facets to it. It's too much work for one person to do. You really need right. these amazing, incredible artists. They need this team behind them, helping them to to make the careers that they want. Right, and I would imagine having a company uh, with you, and I'm sure you have lawyers on staff and marketing agents, I'm sure having a team of dedicated personnel really, really makes that possible. Exactly, we see you know every part of every booking, every engagement from start to finish, mm-hmm. um, every little facet of it. Gotcha. Can you give us a day in the life of a music manager? Like, just give us a sample of how do you start your day? What are some of the tasks you have? Like, what is it? What does your day look like on, on average? Sure. I'd say that my day is different from your average music manager because I work in the operations side of things. So okay. my day, um, I do a lot of I I work with everybody in the company, which is part of why I love my job so much. Um, And I work in so many different facets. So one thing that's really nice about my job is that no day looks the same at all. Um, So it really depends on where we are in the year, the season. Um, Like if we have conferences coming up, I might spend a a whole day just preparing materials, things that we need, or talking to the people at the conference. Um, So it can look really, really different on a day-to-day basis. I think for one of the managers themselves, um, the days might be a lot more similar where where they're connecting with their artists on a a daily or weekly basis, depending on what the artist needs, how busy they are at the time. Um, We we do all the servicing of the engagements for artists. So what that means is we help book their hotel rooms, their flights, their transportation. So a lot of the day will look like that as well. but I think for even for people in my company who are artist managers, I think all of their days look drastically different too. Yeah. And I think that's an appealing thing for most people. Right, right. You're not sitting at a computer crunching numbers. No, no. It's a very, um, you're on the phone all the time. You're talking to people all the time. Mm. You're, we have an accounting department, of course. They're crunching a lot of numbers, but right. um, it is just, it's a people business. Yeah. Would you say it's a lot of problem solving? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Can you just, can you elaborate? Well, well, one example of this maybe is we have um, a booking department, which is kind of like a sales team. And they will be, let's say they have an artist tour. An artist is going out on the road, but they have one date, a little gap in the tour. We have to very strategically place that because we don't want our artists like zigzagging throughout the country, right? We want to very strategically route them um, on a path. Um, so sometimes we have to get really creative and coming up with solutions for how that'll work for an artist. Um, and then we're also dealing with um, presenters, organizations, orchestras who, um, I don't know, maybe an artist, their flight was delayed and, or their flight was canceled because of weather. So we're constantly dealing with these things that crop up um, and problem solving there was an example of one artist who is um, going on tour in Texas, I believe, and they're based in Florida, but there was a hurricane in Florida. And so we had to come up with this really weird combination of some people driving to Georgia and flying to different, it wow. was, like everyone was on different flights in this 12 person group, but we made it work. Wow. Everybody got there to the performance on time. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. Yeah. And I mean, without you and the team of Opus 3, that would not be possible. I, I think it, I don't think it would have happened. Yeah. Wow, that's yeah. incredible. 
How does one get music management? Do performers reach out to you? Do you find and seek talent to cultivate and develop? Like, how does that process work? People definitely reach out to us, but I would say that the prime way we get our artists is from either artists winning competitions or from recommendations, maybe from people who are already on our roster. We have a lot of really great teachers on our roster and sometimes they'll recommend their students to us. Um, Sometimes our artists come from other management companies. There are management companies that are built just to work with very young artists to help them start their careers. And once they've gotten going, they come to us because we're a larger agency um, and we can help continue that um, path for them. So it really varies, but I would say the vast majority of our artists come to us from other recommendations, um, but not from people reaching out to us usually. Gotcha. I remember reading about Dorothy DeLay and what struck me in um, in just her practice is that she was not just a great teacher, but she was also a manager that she would call orchestras, the directors, and they say, hey, I need a performer. And she would be that link that she didn't just teach um, musicians how to play. She also connected them to opportunities. Absolutely. And it's so important. And for someone like Dorothy DeLay, who has had such an incredible roster of students come through her, you know that you can trust what she's saying, the people she's recommending to you. She has a great ear. She has like a, a very reliable history of bringing you the best artists. So that's a, that's a great example. Is there a typical path for, you know, classical musicians to make it big? I mean, we're talking, you know, Sarah Chang, Yo-Yo Ma. Um, I don't know. Is there a mold of, of the path that one takes to achieve that level of stardom? Or it's really all over the place. Like, how does one get to be that good and that big and popular? I do think it's really all over the place. Um, A lot of, of course, a lot of the people that you mentioned, Sarah Chang, Joshua Bell, these people were like young prodigies. Um, They gained attention when they were very, very young. And so they've built these incredible careers. But that's not always the case. You know, sometimes it can take more time. Um, Winning competitions, I think, is a, a really common way that people get noticed and that they get further opportunities. But I don't think there's a one size fits all. There's not just one path that people take. So there's a lot of different ways to get to get there. Gotcha. Is it just competitions? Can you give us some of the names competitions? I also, um, I think one of the artists you manage also won at Avery Fisher Grant. So it's not, I mean, I know it's a competition per se, but can you elaborate on what are some of the competitions by name and also some of the ways people can get that, you know, um, attention. Yeah. So, um, there's like the Tchaikovsky competition, which they have for piano and violin and cello, I believe I could be wrong about that, but, um, you know, the Chopin competitions, there's all of these like high, high level, um, competitions, but as you mentioned, there's also the Avery Fisher career grant. Lots of times that's given to musicians who have already, like achieved a certain level in their career. Maybe they haven't won a competition. That's not, you know, a prerequisite or anything. Um, it's just an easy way, an easier way to get noticed. Um, there, there's a lot of, a lot of different opportunities. We musicians are notoriously allergic to math, (laughs) money, numbers, contracts, and just, just fine print. But are there things that all musicians should know? So for example, having some sense of basic contract law, being good with numbers, knowing how to run numbers, how to talk numbers, how to negotiate a fair price. Um, Regardless of, you know, which part of music you lie in, what should every musician be able to do? And do you have any suggestions of um, how to develop those skills? I think contracts are really important. I think no matter what level you're at, you should at least have a a very basic um, level of understanding for contracts. Even if you're just teaching your own studio out of your own house, a contract's there to protect you. Um, And it's really nice now with the internet, you can get really amazing free contract templates online. So it's not as if you have to come up with this yourself, um, but you should have a base understanding of the fact that you you need one. Um, It protects your students as well. Um, Or if you're gigging, I do think contract law is really important, but not getting into the nitty gritty, just a very basic um, understanding, I think is fine. Um, I don't have any, my, my first job at Opus 3 was as a, a booking assistant. So that's somebody who um, issues our contracts. Mm-hmm. And I had no background. I had absolutely no um, experience with contracts at all. Um, and I learned a lot from it. It was great. So you don't really need to to know the the specifics in the contract law. Um, 
but just being able to find online, look what you need, uh, find what you need to online is a, is a good place to start. For In terms of finance, I think what's lacking in a lot of our educational programs for musicians is finance education regarding taxes, regarding um, you know retirement, <laughs> moving forward. A lot of our gigs, speaking of taxes, a lot of our gigs are, there'll be 1099 income, their taxes aren't taken out. We have to be making sure that we hold enough money back and, and be prepared for that tax bill that's gonna come in April. And a lot of people don't learn about that in school. Um, saving for retirement, budgeting when you aren't really sure if your income is going to be the same every month, if you're a gigging musician or a teaching musician, um, if you you don't have any students over the summer, making sure that you've saved enough for the summer. So I think that there's a lot to do with money that you know we we need to be learning a little bit more. Personally, I mean, I'm very lucky. I grew up in a family that taught me a lot of those things. I don't think everyone's quite so lucky, but even still, I've learned so much just from free resources on the internet. Yeah. Um, I follow a lot of people on Instagram that I learn about budgeting yeah. and retirement from. So I think we're so lucky that we have all these like free resources yeah. on the internet. Can you recommend some of the the better ones? Like who do you follow that you found um, really helpful? Like just for some place for someone to start. Sure. Um, my favorite is Personal Finance Club because it's it's just. Um, this so one guy, he retired early, he sold a business, he made a lot of money, and now he puts out these resources that are very easy to understand, um, very uh, complex things that he's boiled down to very key, simple points. So I love following him, Personal Finance Club, um, specifically for women, because I do think it's also really important for women um, to gain this knowledge as well. Um, her first 100K is a really great resource. Um, she has an Instagram. She just came out with a book um, and a Facebook group that I'm a part of that I really love. <laughs> that's that's amazing. What courses would you recommend for high school and college students to make sure they take if they are in a career to either performing or even um, getting a certificate for teaching to become a public school teacher? Yeah. Um, what courses would you, would you recommend for every student to take? It's really interesting because... I haven't taken any courses myself um, because I learned everything about my job on the job. Um, I just kind of threw myself into it um, and learned there. And I do think that's the best way to learn. That being said, there are a lot of really great music business degrees now. Um, I think Cincinnati, the Cincinnati Conservatory is a really great one. Um, there's a couple in New York, really great music management or business programs. Um, I think if you're able to, an MBA is always great. You learn so much in all different areas of business, but that's not always an opportunity for everybody. Um, Google has some really great courses online too, but honestly, I believe that the best way to learn about this is to just go out and do it and to try it. And if a job that you or an internship that you take doesn't fit for what you like. There's so many else, so many others out there that you can try. Um, but I just think that the best thing that you can do is is get out there, go to your local um, chamber music program if you have one, or a local small orchestra, even a regional orchestra. Everybody needs, even these small orchestras need managers that are helping them to organize the the business every they're all businesses they all need these teams behind them right um so go out in your local community and find an opportunity an internship ask if you can create your own internship these these places probably don't have them it takes a lot of time to to build these programs right. um but they're open they need help so i think they would be open to help yeah so i i think maybe even if someone does say they want to be a performer Maybe it wouldn't bad idea be a bad idea for them to just find the closest local classical music, whether it's a, a chamber group or a youth orchestra even, and maybe say, um, "Hey, can I help you just run the business of it?" Just to kind of get your you know feet wet and just to kind of learn the business side of it, right? Absolutely, because there's so many different facets to that business. All of these orchestras have programming departments. They have people who work backstage to help out. They have um, you know, obviously the upper management, they have librarians 
that I think that's something that people forget that librarians actually audition for their jobs with orchestras. And it's a really cool position for musicians to have. They're tough, but you're still like directly involved in the music. Huh. You're interacting with the musicians every day. So they all have librarians. They have, um, you know, like their general manager, the, the personnel manager. So, so there's so many different facets. And if you could just go to your local organization and market it, like there's so many different opportunities, even just within one organization for you to figure out what you might be interested in. Right. And even if, let's say, you do want to audition for an orchestra, if they have an, a position in a stage crew, I would imagine you would then know about any positions opening up, even as a performer. Like, you're in, if you're involved in the business side of it, you would probably get opportunities that you know, people from the outside don't even know about. Absolutely. Because these are all, again, like businesses, knowing people businesses. It's all about knowing people yeah. and managing and fostering those relationships with people. Um, a lot of the smaller orchestras, the musicians themselves are the personnel managers um, or they're on different committees within the orchestra. So even if you're taking auditions, there are a lot of opportunities. Every orchestra needs to have a musician committee that negotiates with the union. So there, even if you're taking these auditions, there's all of these opportunities for you to get a little bit more involved in the business side if that's something that you're interested in. You mentioned a number of times that this is really a people-based business. What are some personal traits that you would say make you successful or anyone in the business? What are some things important to be just as a person to be successful, obviously in, in all aspects of life, but especially true for just being in the business of dealing with people and um, managing people? Yeah, I think um, the traits that I've learned as a mu musician have served me really well, even outside of my life as um, a violinist. Reliability is probably the number one thing. People just need to know that you're going to show up on time, um, that you're going to be there. Obviously, that's the same for a gig, too. I think what's made me successful at Opus 3, part of it, is a willingness to ask questions, to learn. I came in with only performance degrees. I didn't know anything about the business at all, but I have learned a lot just through um, through asking and learning on the job. And then I think the last thing that that's worked really well for me is just trying to anticipate people's needs too. When I started, I was always told that was something that I did really well. I mean, it's something that I look for when I see, when we are bringing new people onto our team because I do help with a lot of our hiring. Um, so it's always something I love to hear about people when we, when we check their references, when we call the people that you've worked with in the past, that you've just been willing to, um, try to go above and beyond, um, for your, for your work. So the, I think there's a myth out there that either you perform and you're a famous performer or you're a failed musician and you teach. Yep. Um, you know, can we just kind of break that myth down, right? Because, um, there's so many things you can do. And I know you've touched on some of the roles. You could be like librarian or business management. But, um, you know, you can always um, on the weekend get together with friends and play their quartets, right? You can always pick up whether it's a wedding gig or private tutoring or whatever. Um, you know, just the fact that if you're not a performer, can, can you just talk about, you know, the myth of, you know, if you're not a famous performer, you're a failure. Like, can we just talk about that? Um, cause I think, like you said, you also pretty much burnt out, um, after college, um, and university and I've definitely felt the same way. I was like, I don't want this anymore yeah. that, um, and I think a lot of it is the culture is pretty toxic. Um, it's very competitive. There's, a, you know, very few performing opportunities that are at the very high level that are highly compensated. Um, so can we like, can you just break down that myth and also just that negativity and the toxicity of, you know, like, well, if you're not a performer, then you failed. Absolutely. I think that, yeah, the environment can be pretty toxic sometimes. And when we're growing up and we're taking lessons, if, if we go the route of a conservatory or a school, we're majoring in music, we're just taught that this one path is the be all and end all. This is the one you should be auditioning for orchestras. That's all, you know, that's what we want to do. But I think that no matter what you're doing in your life, being a musician even if it's not your career, even if it just becomes a hobby, or if you're doing it part time, that never leaves you. Being a musician doesn't rely on making money from that. That doesn't mean that 
it has to be your only job. Um, I, as I said, I regretted at first um, not performing all the time. It was really, really hard for me. And it took me a really long time to get to a place where I feel happy in my career in all aspects of it. I graduated from my certificate in 2016. It's 2023 now. So it's taken me, you know, a lot, a while, seven years to get to a place where I'm comfortable with the work that I do for Opus 3. The fact that I still have lots of time to gig on the side. I play often around whatever I can get um, and also teach. So I think the key is to, is to give yourself the time to figure out what being a musician means to you because it just looks so different from everybody else. And you have to block out those voices saying that you can only follow this one path because everybody, it's so different what, what it takes for everybody to be happy. And so you just have to figure out that, that formula that it takes for you, um, as a music musician, I still tell people that I'm a musician, that that's my job. I'm a violinist. Um, I have this other job that I really love too. And that's a big part of me, but like at my core, I'm still a musician because I've made it what I want it to be. Right. And I think being a musician is probably a prerequisite for you to be able to be good at your job because you have to know what, you know, in classical music is very different than, you know, rock music or, or you know, other um, professions, right? So I think being a musician first is probably like a huge factor, right? Being a good musician, knowing what it takes, what they go through to be able to support them and uplift them and, sh- you know, have give them the ability to share their craft with an audience. Absolutely. You have to know what you think sounds good. You know, you have to have some level of like knowing um, great musicianship and also an understanding of the repertoire. I think that can't be understated. Knowing um, what concertos a soloist can play um, and what will go well when you're talking about programming a, a concert. You know, you don't just want to like throw certain things together. Everything maybe should have some sort of cohesion to it. And so I do think it's really important. And I also think that everything that it takes to get to our level of being a musician makes you good at everything else that you do. The amount of determination and focus and dedication that we have put into in the practice room makes you better at, at everything else. So even if you're feeling like, I'm not sure what I want to do as a musician. I'm not really sure which of these paths I'm going to want to take. Studying music, I think, is so key anyway. It doesn't matter. Yeah. That relationship between an artist and management, is it, um, do the artists tell you what they want or is it really a give and take? Like, is it um, um, a relationship that ebbs and flows and and is there a lot of back and forth? I'm trying to figure out a a great solution um, It's definitely a lot of give and take. Um, These relationships are cultivated over years and years and people get really close to their managers. It's really nice. And their management teams, because it's, it's all of these people behind you that are helping you, you know, book your flights and everything like that. I think a lot of times musicians will tell us what they want in the long term, um, what their, what their dreams are, where they want to go. And we will do whatever it takes to help them the little decisions that it takes um, to get them to where we want to, where they want to go. Um, They'll let us know repertoire, like what they, what they want to work on, what they will feel nice. So they're very involved in those sorts of conversations. As a woman in the business of classical music, have you had any issues or what are some obstacles that you've had to overcome or you've noticed, um, you know, being in the business side of it? I think I'm really lucky working for Opus 3 because there has been a history of really amazing women in our company specifically. Um, It hasn't always been the case. And I'd say that we're still getting away from like an old boys club, a lot of men running the the industry. But I have a really, I have a lot of really great female role models at Opus 3 specifically. And I know and I feel comfortable with... um, Opus 3's determination to make things an evil, even playing field. Um, I think they've they've shown their commitment to that. But I don't I think that I'm lucky in that way. I think it's they're they're transparent about that, yeah. but I don't think all places are. So again, that's why I love all these resources for women. Um, yeah. because I do think it's really important. Yeah. 
Any advice uh, for women or, you know, young women um, that want to get into the field and maybe they're not sure um, or just any advice in general? Um, you know, obviously it's, you know, different for men and women. Yeah. Um, but like just any advice you have for women that are trying to kind of maybe go a different route, not just be a performer. Yeah, I think the advice I'd give is similar to any woman I would give in, in any industry. And that is that you should apply for something or go for something, even if you don't think you're qualified for it. Mm. They say so many times that men try to, will apply for jobs, even if they're not, um, that they don't match all of the requirements. And women will say, oh, well, I don't fit this one requirement, so I won't apply for this job. And I think that no matter what, you just Mm. have to go for it. You have to try, um, and you might get a little bit more rejection. Um, But I do think that tides are turning, it's shifting, and people are looking for for strong women and, and smart women to do these jobs. Yeah. Sounds like we are our worst enemies, uh, really a case of that, right? I mean, just yeah. from my own personal example, I, I don't know. I've just, I've always had like zero shame. I'm like, let me try, right? <laughs> What's the worst that can happen? That I'll get no, I'll get rejection. Thank you, next, right? right. Um, but it sounds like the more women I talk to, that's not the case. I feel that way myself. I, and I have to tell myself all the time, like, what exactly? What's the worst gonna, that's going to happen? They're going to tell me no. Okay, so they tell me, no, it's no big deal. But I should at least try. I should at least yes. reach out. Um, and then always negotiate your job offers too. Gotcha. <laughs> so women don't do that as much. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that a bit later. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, what are some highlights from your job? Um, any memorable memorable moments that just left you breathless? Any lifelong heroes you've been able to meet? Like, What are some of the highs of being in the business of classical music? There's obviously a really great uh, or large opportunities to go to concerts, which is always really nice. Um, I have had the opportunity to meet Yo-Yo Ma, Emmanuel Axe, um, Yafim Bronfman, Garrick Olson, a lot of these people that I've been listening to since I was a kid. Yeah. Um, that was really, really incredible. I think one of the highlights of my career is something that Opus 3 does that's a little bit um different that's a little unusual every year the united nations puts on a concert called un day and they choose a different country to be the hosts every year and so this country will bring musicians or dance groups um, from their country and put on a concert at the un at in the general assembly which is a meeting space it's not a concert hall so we produce the event and we bring in um, all these vendors who bring in their own lights we build a stage in the general assembly Um, and it's just kind of cool to be able to go into the general assembly because it's not open to the general public even if you take a tour of the un so the fact that i've been there now a couple times just on the floor every time i go there even though i've done it four or five times now it's amazing to me each time Um, so we go and we put on a concert there. Um, and that's always a really, really unique experience and something I never thought I would be able to do. Wow. That's incredible. What are some of the things of the job that you don't enjoy? I mean, no job is perfect, right? Nothing in life is ever perfect. What are some of the things that kind of, um, are maybe just, I don't know, just, just so that we get a level playing field and and we're totally honest and transparent. Like what are some of the parts of the job that you don't enjoy? Well, COVID has been really tough for us, for the whole industry. Um, We had to let some people go because, you know, we weren't getting any income, no performances were happening. And so the people that were left ended up taking on a lot of work. Um, So honestly, the last three years have been a little bit tough. It's come in waves. So there are times where the workload can be like really, like really hard to deal with. this last summer we switched our whole calendar system that we use for our artists like booking calendars where we keep track of where we're going um and i was in charge of that and it was i I was working like really crazy hours so i think that a lot of these jobs can be really tough like workload wise and hours wise if you're working for an orchestra you're gonna have to be working nights and weekends and that can be really tough if you have a family or you want to have a family finding the work-life balance Um, sometimes, especially starting out, these jobs don't pay that well. And we're in the performing arts, classical performing arts. Unfortunately, it's not the greatest paying industry all around, unless you've like reached yo-yo ma levels. Um, so that can be really tough too. 
all in all, it's it's been worth it. Um, and you find these little like moments of joy that make your your jobs worth it. But not every day is is a pleasant day when flights get canceled or you're you're dealing with weather. You're dealing with a global pandemic. Uh, it can be really tough. Yeah, yeah. What are some opportunities that um, high school students, college students, someone that uh, maybe wasn't aware of the business side of classical music? What um, some of the places that the uh, people can look into, like for what jobs are available, even what what are the different parts of the industry, like you mentioned mm-hmm. booking, a librarian, and, and this, mm-hmm. like just where can people t- look to start getting an idea of the industry? There are a couple of great national um, associations where I might start looking just so you can get a sense of some opportunities. Um, the It's called APAP, the Association of Performing Arts Professionals. They hold a conference in New York every year in January. Um, My company attends that conference. It's a a networking conference, but it's also a learning conference. They hold tons of different panels. There's opportunities for internships um, with APAP. There's opportunities for students to attend APAP at a really inexpensive level so that they can just go and learn. Um, there's the League of American Orchestras. Very similarly, they hold a conference every year. There's lots of internship opportunities through them. Um, they hold, you know, webinars throughout the year. So lots of opportunities to learn there. Again, I would reach out to your local, you know, organizations, performing arts organizations, and just see what opportunities they might have, internships that they might have available. Can you share with us a range of benefits and salaries, um, what people can expect if they do go into the business of, of music management, for example, or, or other business um, side of classical music? Like, What can people expect as far as compensation? Sure. So I'll start at the bottom and, and work my way up. Um, a lot of people start out with internships. Um, internships can range, of course, from being unpaid, which I personally don't love, um, but also can can pay maybe a part-time 20 hours a week, um, somewhere minimum wage, 15 to $20 an hour, something like that. Some internships will um, help out with housing, depending on how long and where that internship is. Um, an entry-level position at, at Opus 3 will pay somewhere between forty-five dollars and $55,000 a year. And it'll be full-time. Um, and it'll include all of your health benefits, which is really important. Um, Health insurance, it'll offer a retirement package, 401k, um, transit benefits, all these things to help you, you know, not pay so much in taxes. Mm. Um, That's going to, I find that that entry level position is really going to vary across the different companies. We really value paying people well. um, But I do think that it could be a little bit less for some entry level positions. Of course. Um, as you move up, um, let's say you're an associate manager, you're starting to learn how to become a manager. I would say you can probably make somewhere between 60 and $80,000 a year, all with those same health benefits, um, or, you know, all the benefits that come with that retirement as well. Um, and then every agency is going to pay their managers totally differently. Um, lots of places work off of a, a commission or a bonus structure. So you might get a base salary. And then depending on how much your artists are working, how much commission you're bringing into the company, you'll get paid more. You'll get a percentage of that. Um, I'd say most managers are paid at the least um, maybe 100000 mm-hmm. um, But that then, again, can be a very wide range after that, depending on who your clients are, how much money you're bringing in, your level of experience. Um, and again, that's really going to vary throughout the, the companies. Um, but in the classical side of things, I think that's about where you're at. Right, right. And also, it's not just um, a dollar amount for salary, right? Also, how much time off do you have, the kind of health benefits, right? So I think absolutely. It's, it's all about the package, right? Yes, <clears throat> so. absolutely. And I think you know, the, the longer you stay with the company, too, the better those benefits can be. The longer I've been at Opus 3, the more vacation days I've gotten, the more paid time off I've gotten. Right, right. And I think in general, especially following some of the most successful investors and business people not even in classical music, um, they all come back to the idea that what value do you provide? And I think it's so easy to forget it's me, 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 but really, right, how do you uh, provide value to the company, to the artists that you're you're managing? Absolutely. And you're compensated based on that. So um, I'd like to 
just break down the myth of, again, the, you know, if you're not a performer, you failed, right? That to be in the business of it, that no matter which aspect, whether you're a top-notch performer Mm -hmm. or you're a manager, even an intern, is that even these performers, right, are still in business, right? Absolutely. Right? They, 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 it takes money to get groceries and pay rent mm-hmm. and travel and have nice instruments mm-hmm. and lessons and, you know, um, uh, services instruments, right? So um, can you just talk about that, right? Like, at the end of the day, like, everyone is a business man, woman, um, no matter what you do. Absolutely. Um, it might seem... Uh, like it removes the romanticism of being an artist, maybe to think of it as a business. But I, I think of it as a plus because there's all of us who are like really invested in the performing arts and the classical music world. Um, and the fact that all of these artists and companies or businesses provide us with a lot of opportunities to help support these artists and facilitate these performances in our own way. So because all of these things are, are businesses, they all need input from a wide variety of places in order to to function so we've talked about this but this gives us opportunities in in marketing in different orchestras um i always think that musicians make the best programmers for orchestras we need to have more people who who know the repertoire know the music better to help program for these orchestras Um, so while it is a business i do think it provides us with all of these opportunities to support something that we really believe in yeah so even you're in the business of classical music i think it's it's just as important because you know your work of you and your company really empowers these incredible artists to share their art with an audience right so you know if you're involved in a business it doesn't make it any less it's almost makes it more because you know if you have insight to be creative and and you know, um, come up with something truly spectacular that you're really empowering them to share their craft. Absolutely. At the end of the day, we're all here to support the craft and the art. And it, it takes all of these people from all these different facets to make it happen. Yeah. Can you share the exact path at Opus that you took? Like, how did you go to where you are now? Um, like, just could you yeah, share that with us? Absolutely. So I started um, as a booking assistant, which is one of our entry level positions. Um, I was responsible for working with our sales team. I reported to three people who um, they weren't managers. Their entire job is essentially sales. They're booking our artists around the country. Uh, could you specify sales of what? Say, uh, sales of ticket prices or uh, selling the artists to venues? Selling our artists to venues okay. or orchestras. Um, We're kind of unique, actually, that we have a booking department. Not every management company will have that. Um, But we have this sales team that works only in the United States and Canada um, that books our artists with um, with orchestras, with performing arts centers, with chamber music series, recital series, so that we can give our artists as many opportunities as possible. Gotcha. So it's not just left up to the managers. The managers still book their artists all over the place. It's still a huge part of their jobs, but the the booking agents are able to reach more people just because you have more people, you have more time. So we'll get more opportunities for our artists. Right. So I worked for three um, booking agents and I was responsible for producing the contracts for all of the engagements that they booked. Um, and again, I had no experience in contracts, so I learned right. a lot. I didn't have to actually yeah. write the contracts. You know, we use a template right. that we change depending on the artist and the the money that they're um, yeah. bringing in. But uh, that was definitely a learning experience for me. And it was my job to track the contract from start to finish. Um, what do you mean by that? So once a date was booked, I would issue the contract. It still needed to be seen by other people in the office to make sure I didn't make a mistake. Of course. Um, and so I would distribute it through the office, make sure everybody had their eyes on it who needed to. And then I would send it out to the presenter. And we gave them a deadline when we wanted it back. And that was always hard to get people to, get to adhere to. So I always had to um, like chase them for their contracts back. But that was nice too, because then I got to meet and talk to a whole, a whole lot of yeah. people throughout the country. Yeah. Um, 
So, and then when it finally came back from them, I would distribute it internally again and make sure that, you know, they've made changes to the contract, most likely. They're not just going to leave it as is. So I make sure everybody who needed to saw it and then it got signed and sent back out. And so that the contract like lived its whole life from start to finish. Wow. How big, uh, if you might, if I <clears throat> may interrupt, how big yeah. is a typical contract? Um, our template is five pages. Okay. So it's not like a 40 page document. No, absolutely not. And the first two of that are... Um, kind of specific to that engagement. It'll have that specific artist. Any specific things that that artist needs would be included just in the first two. The last three were then boilerplate that are just the same for absolutely every contract that we don't change. I really liked that job. Yeah. That was the first time as a musician, I feel like even once we've performed a recital, performed an orchestra concert, chamber music, whatever it is, it always felt like my work was never done. Because something could always be better, right? You're like, oh, I missed that one note. That note was out of tune or what, any of these things could have been better. This was the first time in my life I had a job where I saw something from start to finish. And once it was done, it was done. It was so satisfying. It mm. was a feeling that I hadn't, you know, felt that often before. Um, how do, you know, even in, in high school and college, you know, I would go to, you know, Philly Orchestra, New York Philharmonic, all these concerts. But like, I mean, I never even thought about like, how do these artists get booked? I mean, can you describe in more detail, like how do orchestras, you know, how far is it, you know, six months? Is it a year in advance? How do like just how do these huge organizations, um, you know, book their concerts and artists and, and like, how does just that work? Yeah, they book very far in advance. I'd say between a year um, and well, between six months and two years out. Wow. depending um especially the the bigger organizations the bigger orchestras will book um farther in advance and especially for conductors conductors will we, we represent conductors as well not just soloists um uh -huh. they'll book um even farther in advance sometimes i think i in our calendar system i've seen things not not confirmed but still penciled in people's calendars into 2027 and 2028 wow. like things That's can wild. book very very far in advance <clears throat> yeah um, again, a lot of these things are based off of personal relationships. A lot of these people have been working together for decades, even if they're not at the same organizations that they've always been. Yeah. Um, so programming departments, CEOs of orchestras will reach out to us if they're interested in booking our artists. Yeah. A lot of times, if it's an orchestra, it'll be dependent on the conductor. So conductors right. will have relationships with soloists. Yeah. And if they want to bring... A soloist, they'll tell their artistic team that this is who I want. You know, we've played this together before. We maybe want to do the same thing or something different. Yeah. So these relationships, no matter where you are, th you'll have them. Yeah. And I guess that's where it's so important to make sure, right, you're reliable, you're kind, you're nice, yeah. you're respectful, right? You're, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, uh, you have an abundance mindset, right? That it's not, you know, if I get this gig, someone else doesn't, right? It, right. Everybody can win. Um, and just, um, yeah, I guess that's where that personal, it's so much more than just, you know, being good at your craft. There's that whole interpersonal relationship. They're just so important. Yeah. Yeah. How do, and I'm not sure if, if you know, but how do artists get paid? So let's say a, a, a big, um, a, you know, famous artist plays a gig with Cincinnati Orchestra, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Whatever, LA Philharmonic, right? Yeah. A soloist. How, how does that, that logistics of how do they get paid? Do they split profits? Is it how many tickets they sell? Is is their compensation dependent on how many people they bring in? Mm -hmm. So I know like Sarah Chang sells out. Right. Right. Um, so then how does the logistics of just the, the payment on that scale work? It's really interesting because this is something that's very different, I think, from the in the classical world than it is from the pop side of things. Um, most classical artists just get a flat fee. Okay. And it's not dependent on ticket sales at all. So we will negotiate. This is what we do. We'll negotiate a fee um, with the organization. And at the end of the service, they actually pay us. And we get a, a percentage commission. That's how we earn our money okay. for the work that we've done in facilitating this concert. Um, and so they'll pay us and then we that's another service we provide for our artists is the accounting of it all we'll, we'll do statements and everything for them um and then we'll, we'll send them the money as well gotcha there are a couple of times where we will do things like percentage deals or t uh, deals based off of ticket sales it's more common with performing arts centers and more um 
what we call attractions, more like touring choirs, um, things that are a little bit more commercial than your average classical artist. Um, so we might negotiate a deal that is based off, they'll get a certain amount of money when they hit a certain level of ticket sales um, or a percentage. Like if they've hit a certain revenue marker, they'll get a percentage of the cut too. So it really depends, but that's definitely a more commercial thing yeah. than our standard soloist um, with orchestra or chamber music recital. It won't, it won't be dependent on ticket sales. Yeah. Do you have venues reach out to you? Not necessarily. Um, I'm just thinking uh, in Brooklyn, I know there's national sawdust to mm-hmm. put things. Um, do you have venues reach out to you and say, Hey, we want to, you know, uh, have more classical music. Can you help us with placing an artist? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. All the time. Wow. Yep. Okay. Um, what can classical musicians do that are performers to be more successful, right? Um, I know, for example, in, in the movie industry, um, it's not always the best uh, actors to get the gig, but mm. that have the big following because they know they'll bring in the, the uh, people that will watch their shows, right? Absolutely. So what can classical musicians do, like a strong social media presence? Um, I don't know, like interviews? Like what can, yeah. what can musicians that choose to go the route of being a performer what can they do to help their business side of their um their really their um not a persona but you know their 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 brand absolutely um well obviously social media is really important because if you have the reach to bring in ticket ticket sales ticket buyers that's going to really help but i also think that um, community engagement is really really important um especially now people are looking for artists who are willing to go into their communities, give workshops, give masterclasses, give interviews, um, even just like a little talk about your career. Like so many of our artists will do things um, like talk about the business side, how they got to where they are, um, so that it's not just engaging the the ticket buying community, but it's engaging everybody in the whole community and, and making partnerships with all these other people in the community. So I think the more wider variety of community engagement you can offer, the better. Earlier we spoke that um, so much of the top performing levels of success is winning a competition or getting noticed. Mm -hmm. But a huge part of that is the decades of work that comes getting there, right? And people don't don't always, you know, I mean, musicians understand that, but people that um, are not musicians, I think, don't quite get that, right? Um, But teachers play a huge, excuse me, um, aspect of being able to get there, not just skill wise, but also relationship wise, opportunity wise. Um, can you talk about the importance of choosing the right teacher if you want to go that route and if, if you think you have what it takes of um, just the stamina and, and even the nerves, right, to yeah. get up in front of a $20,000, uh, 20,000 people crowd or a concert hall and to do your thing with one shot, right, mm-hmm. which is really nerve breaking. Yeah. Um, but can you talk about teachers and, and how they can Um, make or break an artist as well as how to find them and then also can you talk about some of the people that you studied with that have reached the pinnacle of perfection of uh, just just an amazing top top of the world artist sure I think that your teach the relationship you have with your teacher is probably the most important one that you have Um, I I think that when you're making a decision on teachers, you have to look at a couple things. I think the most important thing is your rapport with the teacher. So it's a really personal thing. If a teacher can have a great history of, of students who have been successful, but if you don't work well with them, they're not going to be inspiring you to do the work that's necessary to get where you want to go. So that might not be the right fit for you. Um, so I think finding somebody with whom you have a good relationship and you can work well with is the number one important thing. But you should, if if you have these like very high high level goals you want to whether it's getting in, into an orchestra or becoming a soloist you should look at that teacher's history do they have a history of their students winning jobs in orchestras or do they have a history of their their um, students becoming soloists with orchestras I would take a look at that because it doesn't necessarily matter where they teach if they're getting the results that's all that matters can we come back to your path at opus and um, you mentioned something really interesting about you kind of created your own job. Can you share with us a bit more on that? Yes, sure. So um, as I said, I started as a booking assistant. Um, and then 
the next gradual um, promotion after that is becoming a managerial assistant in our company. And so while I was working more on the sales and booking side of things, managerial offices work directly with the artists. And so I thought with my background, that was the next logical step for me. Um, so I tried that out for a little while. It was not for me. Okay, <laughs> um, it was, um, I mean, I loved working with artists. That was fantastic. But I just didn't love as much... Um, I, I wasn't the right person to be booking their flights and their hotels. Um, it just, it wasn't the right fit for me. So I went and I talked to a couple of people at my company. I said, look, I really love living here, uh, working here, living here, working here. Um, but I don't think this is the right fit for me. And I don't, it wasn't the right fit for them either. They probably wanted somebody else in that position. And I said, with, you, you know, I've worked here for a while with my strengths. Like, can we find something that, that works better for me? And so I went back to the booking side of things, but I started working directly with our chief revenue officer. That was his title at the time. And we were, um, I started doing more um, tracking of the sales department, doing more financial things, tracking Mm -hmm. their metrics, making sure that they're booking enough dates that we need them to book. Um, And I loved it. And so from there, I I built and I I found my niche. And so there had never been... um, We didn't have a chief operating officer at the time. We didn't have a director of operations or an operations manager. No one really was filling that that role. And so because I was loving it so much, I kept learning more. I did my own research. I learned better how to work in Excel. You know, I had just taken one like Excel course in high school. And so I started looking at free YouTube videos. All of this stuff is online for free. It's amazing. Um, And learning more about that and... um, our chief revenue became our chief operating officer because that's what his strengths were in too. And I kept working with him. And so I, I kind of built this position based off of my strengths and the value that I could add to Opus 3. And, you know, it took me a while to get exactly what the right fit was for me. But now that I found it, I'm really happy with my job. And I think all it took was just being honest and asking them like what other opportunities where is there a hole at opus three that i can help fix um you know my strengths like so i think having that open dialogue and being being able to create this position has made me so much happier yeah so i I think being creative is really um really just paramount to success because if if something isn't working out then that's just not the path for you and you can create your own opportunities, right? And you just have to just be open and communicate, right? Exactly. And try new things. And something if something's not going to work, that's okay. And then yeah. you just try something else. Yeah, absolutely. Do you deal with artist burnout? Um, do you have artists that push themselves too hard and book too many dates? Um, how do you make sure that artists don't burn out? Like, um, you know, because, you know, traveling is very taxing. It's really exhausting. Um, you know, is it kind of like it's up to the relationship of the manager and the artist to make sure that um, it's at the right place and the right balance? Um, like, how, just how does that work? Making sure that they're not, you know, overworked. It definitely happens. Um, we have artists who ask for sabbaticals. Maybe they just need six months or yeah. a year off because, yes, they've just burnt out so much. They've been so successful that it's been too much. Um, right. That absolutely happens. And I do think that it's dependent on the relationship with the manager. I think. You know, you would think like, oh, you want to book these artists as much as you possibly can because that's how we earn our income too and we want to be successful. But part of being successful is acknowledging that these people can't do too much and we have to, you know, make sure that they're living good, happy, comfortable lives as well. And yeah, it can be really strenuous on the road. I mean, some of our our soloists are, are, are never home or they'll take a two-week vacation all year and that's the only time off right. they get. Um and I think it's really important. You have to be making sure that you're constantly having these conversations. You can't just have one and then let it go a couple of years without it happening. You have to make sure that the dialogue is is constant. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just know myself, for me, traveling and being all over the place is not a good fit for me. I just uh, mentally mm-hmm. and physically, that's not something I would be successful in. And I think that realization um, said, you know, like, let's put this whole performance stream of whatever it might be on hold. Mm-hmm. Like, that's not, and, and that's, you know, I really just, uh, my mom is a piano teacher, so oh, okay. I, I really just, um, you know, I, I fell in love with teaching, mm-hmm. even in college, and I was like, I think that's my road yeah. uh, to success. Um, but yeah, I think knowing yourself, and, and like, I know I don't do well with being on the road all the time, like, I need stability. So I think for me, um, 
And I would imagine the business being more involved in a business would probably be more stable as far as just, you know, work-life balance, right? You're not on the road all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. No. And my job in particular, one nice thing about not working with artists is that I do have a really great work-life balance because I'm not getting calls from artists who had a flight canceled at right. you know 8 p.m. when I really should be done working. But that's the reality of the job and you make up for it in other ways. And of right. course, artists have large teams, so it's not all on one person. Right. Um, but I think work-life balance is really important and in acknowledging as you said, that wouldn't have been a great path for you because you've, you know yourself and you've listened yeah. to what you need. And that's really important regardless of, of yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you so much for making the time to be here. We will put all the links to the resources um, and things people could, can look into. Um, you also mentioned that uh, Opus has some openings. Can you share with us what are some of the positions that you know of that are open now that maybe someone that needs... Um, wants to pursue that route can look into. Yes, I believe we have two open positions right now, um, one of which is for a touring coordinator position. So this position works directly with um, our large touring orchestras because we book uh, or international orchestras that come in, uh, American orchestras that come in. Um, so this would be um, a position that works largely with those groups. Um, then we also have a kind of like an entry level assistant position open up. Um, everything's available on our website. That job is more similar to how I started. I believe it's kind of a, actually it might be a great first job because it's a, a split between the booking department and between the managerial mm -hmm. department. So you kind of get an, an eye into both worlds. Yeah. Um, so yeah, those are the two jobs we have open and they're both on our website. Awesome. Would you recommend someone to wait for the perfect opportunity or to just take whatever's there and have the experience to have more of a real world? I would take the opportunity, yeah. even if it's not quite right. You're going to learn so many things. You're going to learn what's right for you, what's wrong for you, even if you know already some of the things that are wrong for you. And you're going to meet people. And yeah. that's the number one important thing. Right. I got my job because I knew somebody who used to work at Opus 3. So many of our successful, so many of my colleagues who are successful, it's because they they came from recommendations of people that we knew we could trust. Um, and that's how they've, you know, gotten connected. So I would just take it. Yeah, gotcha. No, absolutely. I, I would, uh, same. I mean, just, just you learn so much from um, just experience and mm -hmm. doing and meeting people than just make waiting for the perfect opportunity that there. No I don't such, think that no yeah, doesn't thing. exist. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Any last advice for musicians that might be watching this video um you know no matter the age um, what would you say to a younger self i would just say it takes a lot of hard work um and your path might not be linear you're gonna have your ups and downs but the, you'll never lose the music like you you'll you should just keep going keep trying try different paths um look for different opportunities everybody is so different you have to just find what works best for you and there'll be something out there for you right like uh you can always play right like no one can tell me hey yeah. you can't play right so you can always get together with friends um i think being a performer it doesn't have to be a job per se Right. And exactly. Yeah. It can just be something that you do for you. And there's right. no shame in that at all. That's wonderful. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I speak to, I still keep in touch with, um, I was in Philly Youth Orchestra mm -hmm. and I keep in touch with some of colleagues from there. And uh, yeah, they say that highlight of the week is just getting together and playing quartets. My highlight from school was always sight reading parties. <laughs> sight reading chamber sight music. Sight reading parties. Yeah, oh yeah. my gosh. Tell me, do tell, yeah. tell more. Oh my gosh. We used to get together and have food and maybe a little bit of alcohol was involved. And then we would um, just like sight read string quartets. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, well, thank you so much. We'll put all the links for our viewers to peruse and I uh, really appreciate your time. And this has been an uh, eye-opening um, talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been really fun. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this video helpful and inspirational. A zero cost way to support this channel is to subscribe, like the video, and leave a comment. Links to Violin Explained Etsy Music Apparel Store can be found in the description below. If you'd like to see books such as scales and method books that I published, a link to my author's page on Amazon can be found in the description as well. Please share any ideas or thoughts that you'd like covered in the next videos. And thank you for your interest in music.